Thank you for the introduction and thank you for joining me for today's webinar. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, some considerations when purchasing an eddy covariance system from Campbell Scientific. In particular, I'd like to go through some research site considerations when planning for your, for your tower or tripod placement, our open path eddy covariance system offerings, closed path eddy covariance system offerings, energy balance and biomet sensors, and then touch on some atmospheric profile measurements, and finally wrap up with some data acquisition and software. So starting with research site considerations for eddy covariance measurements, when choosing a research site, what are some salient characteristics that need to be considered? Some of these include making sure that you have adequate footprint or fetch, that you have a spatially homogeneous and structurally uniform canopy, which is important for some assumptions that we make in the eddy covariance theory and in the derivation of the terms for the vertical flux. And then also measurements that are being made in mixed surface layer above the canopy to ensure that we're in what's called the constant flux layer and that the measurements are on the downwind side of your zone of influence. So in other words, what you want to measure is upwind of your tower and your sensor is placed downwind of that. Okay, so let's start with what is a footprint area or a fetch? So because the wind is displacing or moving molecules, the sensors effectively see the vertical flux from an area upwind of the tower. And this area is called the footprint or fetch. The footprint or fetch can grow and the influence under the footprint can also change. So the footprint depends on the measurement height, the surface roughness, and also the atmospheric layer, atmospheric boundary layer stability. Here's a cartoon representation of a Campbell Scientific open path eddy covariance system. This particular station has an EC150 and a CSAT 3A, and it's located at two meters above the canopy. So there's a rule of thumb that for every meter above the canopy you go, you get about 100 meters of fetch, total fetch. So in this case, we have about 200 meters of total fetch. Now, if we vary the height, if we raise this up, we can see the contribution of flux here, represented by this peak in our ribbon. That contribution of flux will grow or move further out as we go higher up. If we bring that sensor lower, then the contribution of flux will move closer to the tower, so this ribbon will move this way. This is important for two reasons, or multiple reasons, but two of them that I'll mention. You have to pay attention to the things that you place around your tower. If you place battery banks or solar panels too close to your tower, then your sensors will pick up the influence from those depending on if your sensors are, are closer to the ground. So if you have this mounted closer to the ground and this zone of influence or, or flux contribution kind of moves closer to the sensor or to the tower, and you could start to get influence of your fluxes from the, from the things that you're placing at the feet of that tower. So it's always good to place those items behind and further away. Also, on the other end of the spectrum, if you go up really high, then your zone of influence or your flux contribution grows, and you may start to capture other canopies or other landscapes that you aren't, aren't really part of your zone of interest, and now they're influencing your fluxes. Another contribution to um, your, your, your uh, footprint in the, um, is the surface roughness. So the surface roughness can be estimated by 0.15 times the height of the canopy. So as that canopy gets higher and higher up, your roughness um, basically uh, decreases your footprint. Okay, so the rougher the canopy is, then the footprint influence becomes less, or, or sorry, the, the contribution of the footprint um, occurs at a, at a shorter distance, okay? So the ribbon is moved closer to the sensor. So let's imagine you had alfalfa here, 
um, and you had a you know full height growth of alfalfa, then that contribution of the flex footprint will be occurring closer to this analyzer. If you were to cut that alfalfa, now you've decreased the roughness and you've increased the footprint. So this ribbon will move out and that um, contribution of flux will get smeared out more. Finally, atmospheric boundary layer st stabilities can also influence where the contribution of flux is coming from in your footprint. So if you have <clears throat> really well mixed uh, atmosphere, strongly convective, say middle of the day, uh, really, um, you know, lots of eddies, really strong mixed uh, uh, flux, most of that flux contribution within your footprint is going to occur closer to the tower. If you, um, as, as that uh, stability increases and you go into neutral and stable conditions, say for example at night, your footprint influence begins to grow and spreads out. Again, this is very important to make sure that what you are measuring is, is of interest. So to summarize here, again, the, the local surface layer grows at a rate of approximately one vertical meter per 100 horizontal meters. And that the FET should be homogeneous and flat and not have any abrupt changes in vegetation height. The sensors are restricted from both the top and the bottom. From the top, we're restricted by upwind fetch of the area of interest. So we can only go so high before we'll start to get into an area of interest that we don't want necessarily. From the bottom, we're restricted by the frequency response errors and corrections. So if we start to come too close to the bottom, we can get into areas where we can't resolve the very small high frequency eddies and they'll get averaged out and we'll, we'll have to put in some corrections or we'll get into a noise, a noise band. Uh, from the top, not only is it the, the area of interest restricting us, but also eventually you'll get out of our constant flux layer and get above that constant flux area, error, er, constant flux area or layer, and you'll start to get into layers that are unaffected by the land surface, which is not where we want to be for eddy covariance. Okay, so now that we've talked about some research site considerations, let's also touch on uh, the differences in open path and closed path systems. So what is an open path system? And what are some advantages of an open path EC system? And what are some disadvantages of an open path EC system? So when we look at the open path gas analyzer design, we have to consider the geometric design our advantages and disadvantages, and then also considerations when we're choosing which design to go with. So the open path design literally means that it's exposed to the environment. So it is an open sampling volume. So where we have a source on the top and a detector on the bottom, the volume between those two is our measurement volume and it's open to the environment. Same thing with a sonic anemometer. This volume here is exposed to the environment and is therefore open. So some advantages come with this. So if you have an open path gas analyzer, you have a fairly high frequency response. So this allows you to put that sensor closer to the ground and, and you can resolve those very small high frequency eddies. This is because you don't have anything influencing um, your, your, uh, your volume like tubing. So if you have tubing uh, bringing a sample into a closed path sample design, then that airstream can interface with the walls of the tubing and you can get errors, frequency errors that need to be corrected. In addition to the open path design having high frequency response, we also have relatively low power. So we don't have to worry about pumping air or heating intakes. So we have a relatively low power uh, case. And then also a relatively simple installation. <clears throat> so in the case of both our EC150, CSAT 3A and Ergoson combo, they're mounted to a bracket, a single bracket that goes at the end of a boom. So that's a fairly easy installation. When you move into closed path, then you have to deal with tubing 
and also mounting the pumps and enclosures. So some disadvantages is one of them is we have to account for density effects on our CO2 measurements. So uh, temperature and water vapor can affect our CO2 densities because we're working in densities and make it look like an apparent flux when there isn't a real flux occurring. This is corrected by something called the webb pyramid looning correction and is just another correction that we have to worry about with an open path. Um, the open path is also subject to window contaminations. So because it's exposed to the environment, bird droppings or rain or other contaminants can get on the windows and affect our signal strengths. Now we calibrate for this in the factory, but when things aren't spectroscopically flat, we can't account for that and we can get errors in our measurement. Another thing we, uh, that becomes more difficult with an open path is the calibration procedure. So because it's open, we need to put a shroud over the measurement volume here in order to flow our span and zero gases. And this requires typically either somebody hanging from the tower and, and putting the shroud on or taking the instrument down, bringing it back to the lab and doing the calibration. The problem with that is, is that when you go to put the instrument back up following the calibration, there are some procedures that you're going to have to redo such as the planar fit correction that's needed to level the instrument. Okay, so with a closed path eddy covariant system, we, we look at the same things. What are some advantages and disadvantages of that closed path and what by definition makes a closed path? So we're going to look at, again, geometric design, the advantages and disadvantages, and considerations when choosing. So some advantages, or I'm sorry, so, so for the geometric design, the closed path ergos have a sample cell, or a sample volume enclosed in a cell. In this case, it's within this clam shell. So in here is the sample cell right here, and we have a gas analyzer that goes um, on either side of that sample cell. So the <clears throat> air sample is brought in through our vortex intake, which filters the air, pass down this tube, and then enters into the sample cell where the beam of light from our gas analyzer is shining. So the, some advantages of this is that we have precise measurements of both temperature and pressure in this cell. So we can account for those things that the Webb Pierman Looning is correcting for in the open path design by precisely measuring temperature and pressure and working in a conserved quantity like the mixing ratio. Um, we also have less optic contamination in a closed path. So whereas an open path is exposed, a closed path either has a filter that filters out dirty air, or in our case, a vortex that bypasses dirty air and lets only clean air come into the sample cell where the optics are located. Now, if obviously, if either the vortex fails or something gets past a filter, we can get dirty air down the, down the tube and it can get deposited on the windows of the closed path. So there still may be some maintenance needed, but not nearly as much as you would have on an on a open path. Also, there's some online calibration um, options with our systems. So with our CPEC 300, uh, 306 and C, or sorry, with our CPEC 310, our closed path system, you can add an optional uh, tank of zero air and tank of CO2 span gas and use a valve module under data logger control to perform an online calibration on an interval that you set. So some disadvantages of that closed path is that it doesn't have as high of a frequency response as our open path. So the sample tubing and sample and tubing interaction and high frequency attenuation is a real concern. So as the air is going down that tubing, there's interaction with the walls that cause increased lag time from when the, the measurement was first brought into the inlet and when it is actually being analyzed by the, the analyzer. Also, there's higher power because you have a pump and most likely heat on the intake. And then there's also more difficult installation as now you have fittings and tubing that and pumps that you need to account for. So when would you use a closed path versus an open path? Well, 
as you can look at the advantages and the disadvantages, if you have an environment that has a lot of rain or a lot of contaminants in the air, it might be better to go with a closed path. In our case, with the vortex intake, we can deal with fairly high levels of uh, pollution and also with, um, with, with rain. We have a rain uh, cap on here. So that can allow us to operate even under those conditions where an open path would struggle with that, uh, with those optics that are exposed to those contaminants. Um, where you may want to use an open path is that if you have a very small or, or very short canopy, and you, so you need to resolve those really high frequency eddies, the high frequency response of the open path will be better. On a remote can, at a remote site where you have very uh, little power uh, available, you may need to go with an open path because then you don't have to worry about having the pump or the heat, the added power for the pump and the heat. But the downside is that if something contaminates the windows um, at that site, it may be a while before you can get back to clean those optics. So it's really a toss up on the remote site, which one is a better case or which one is a better uh, solution. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to touch on is energy balance sensors. So energy balance, what is an energy balance? It's simply the net radiation minus the ground heat flux, which is balanced by how that energy is partitioned into latent and sensible heat flux. Okay, so Rn minus G equals Le plus H. Which sensors would you use to measure an energy balance? <clears throat> well, you'd use an Ergoson or EC150, CSAT3A, or a CPEC 300, 306, or 310 to measure the latent heat and the sensible heat. You'd measure the net radiation with a four-way net radiometer or just a net radiometer. And you'd measure the ground heat flux with a, a heat flux plate combined with some soil temperature sensors. In this case, these are averaging soil temperature sensors and then a soil volumetric water content sensor, such as a CS650 or 655. So these two sensors are really needed to get at the storage above the plate. So the storage plus the, that um, plate flux is the total G in this equation. So why would you want to add energy balance sensors? Well, really, this is to verify, help verify our EC fluxes. So are we partitioning, are our sensors accurately partitioning um, the incoming available energy into latent and sensible heat flux? If we're able to do that, if our sensors are perfect and we're capturing exactly what's coming in and how it's being partitioned, then Rn plus Le plus H plus G should equal approximately zero. So the reality is though that normally we're only going to get between 80, 90%, sometimes a little bit higher on our energy balance closure. And that's because we don't, we're not perfect and, and our instruments aren't perfect. They're pretty, pretty good, but we still struggle and everybody struggles with closing energy balance 100% of the time. And it's been a question that scientists have been trying to resolve of where are we missing in this equation to not get 100% closure all the time. And continues to be a debate. Okay, so moving on from energy balance sensors, uh, the next thing we could talk about is storage and advection. So what is a storage flux? And when would you need to measure a storage flux? So this is a fairly complex um, representation of a of a theoretical measurement volume or box over a canopy. And this was taken from Finnegan 2003. Really what we wanna think about in this box for this webinar is the fluxes that are coming in and out of that box and the storage representing basically our source and sink strength, okay? So if we consider a control volume with a source or sink strength of substance X, that X can either accumulate be absorbed as storage or be transported in and out of the box either by advection or by uh, turbulence. Okay, so the source or sink strength we can represent as the net ecosystem exchange. It's what our eddy covariance system is measuring. That equals the storage plus the advective transport plus the turbulent transport. Okay, 
Now, uh, coincidentally, eddy covariance has a lot of assumptions, and with those assumptions, such as having that homogeneous can canopy, heter uh, homogeneous uh, horizontal canopy, we can throw away a lot of terms, such as trans uh, evective transport, which leaves us with turbulent transport and storage. So how significant is the storage term? Well, that really depends on our boundary layer stability. So if we look at this, uh, this figure from Stull 1988, this black portion represents the nocturnal boundary layer, and it's uh, a, a stable boundary layer. So from sunset, you can see that this boundary layer begins to grow. And so as that boundary layer begins to grow, we get less and less mixing of the air. And we can get a, an accumulation of something like CO2 building up below our sensor that our sensor doesn't see. And then the sun comes up, and then that boundary layer begin or that uh, stable nocturnal boundary layer grows and or shrinks into a mixing layer. So our mixing layer comes up and churns up that gas that has stored below our sensor. Okay. So coming back to that theoretical box again, remember I said we have a storage term, an advective term, and a turbulent term, and that our assumptions are going to allow us to get rid of some of these terms. So we're only left with our vertical turbulent term and our storage term. So again, if we assume things like horizontal gradients are negligible, horizontal integration is unnecessary, and that mixing ratios and turbulent fluxes are representative of the whole the volume, we can essentially take this equation here, get rid of the horizontal advection term, and end up with a storage term, a turbulent term, and a vertical advection term. Well, we can actually get rid of that vertical advection term as well because we assume that the average vertical wind speed um, is zero. So that gets rid of our, that term. So we get a term measured by the eddy covariance system, the turbulent vertical transport, and we get a term measured by something like a profile system, our storage term. Okay, so again, let's let this this figure is from Aubin A 2012 and, and really showcases uh, the the storage term. Okay, so if we have a blue line, which is our EC measure, or I'm sorry, our actual CO2 flux in this case. And we have a black line, which represents, um, sorry, right here, black line, which represents what our tower is measuring, our eddy covariance system is measuring. We can see that there's a discrepancy in the actual flux and what we see, where the red means that the eddy covariance system is underestimating it, and the green is overestimating. So you can imagine overnight, we're underestimating the flux because we get this buildup of CO2 underneath our, our sensor. Then the sun comes up and we become get a mixed system. So we get all of that built up gas that comes up and now the sensor sees it. So we overshoot the actual flux. And then here's nighttime again as we build up storage. So in this case, the red and the green actually equal each other. So if that's the case, why do we even need to measure the storage flux? Well, it's because measuring the flux at night is very difficult. And in 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 there's things like stratification that decouples the surface and the uh, surface and measurement systems. <clears throat> Excuse me, growing footprint, horizontal gradients developing, non-stationarity conditions happening. So there's other things happening at night that makes measuring flux at night difficult. So instead of that, we could quantify the the um, the storage with something like the AP200 profile. This can include up to eight intakes. It integrates the logger and the uh, and a CO2 H2O gas analyzer, and it integrates a data logger program that gives us our storage flux. You can also add a, an optional temperature profile. So when you have something like an AP200, you have to have considerations of where you put the intakes to measure the storage. So if you have grasses and short crops, you want to have at least four intakes and have them have the bottom intake within the canopy and the remaining intakes equidistant up to the sensor, the eddy covariance sensor. For forests, you want two intakes above the canopy, one top one in the well-mixed layer below the EC, and then one intake at mean canopy height uh, 
and the rest capturing ecologically significant strata. Okay, and this is all taken from uh, Munger et al. 2012. So here's a real world example from the late Ray Looning, who always preached that you really need to pay attention to storage fluxes. That is significant. And here's the reason why he, he said that. So imagine a tower. So this is a um, you know 80 meter tall tower. And then you can see here gradients of CO2 at two different time periods, one at 9 o'clock p.m. and one at 11 o'clock p.m. At 9 o'clock p.m. at the base of this tower within the canopy, we have about 420 ppm. Just two hours later, that CO2 grows to about 570 ppm. And you can follow this all the way up and see how the storage or how, how the CO2 is, is building up below the sensor up here that it can't see. If we had an AP200 system here, we can do things like this and then actually calculate the storage term and add it into our eddy covariance term to give us our total flux term. Okay. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is a bit about data acquisition and software. I get these questions quite often about which data loggers are suitable for an eddy covariance system and is there software available for calculating fluxes with corrections applied. So some requirements for the data logger for, for use in eddy covariance systems is that it has a fast processor, high analog channel counts to bring in your, eddy, or your energy balance sensors and your biomed sensors, has digital I.O. ports, dedicated voltage ports, and card expansion. So really, we, we, there was some data loggers earlier than the CR5000 that were used for eddy covariance, but the CR5000 was really the one that brought us to the forefront for data logging eddy covariance data. And it allowed us to have high channel counts and a, and a card module and a processor fast enough to take 10 or 20 hertz measurements and store them. From there, we moved to a CR3000, which had a, a, an even better processor and then the 5000. Had less channel count, but still quite a few channels, and an expandable um, module for a card. Moving forward, as we developed the EasyFlux DL program, we realized that on the CR3000, we could only, only had enough headroom to do full corrections at 10 hertz. We recognize that there are people that want to measure at 20 hertz and do full corrected eddy covariance measurements on the data logger. So the CR6 and CR1000X really provided us with that fast processor to allow us to do measurements of EC at 10 or 20 hertz and do the, all the corrections and output a fully corrected flux all within the time allotment that we had. And also we were able to add in the Volt 108 and Volt 116 to give us our channel expansion count that we needed to match the older loggers. Okay, so in addition uh, to that data logger, what I keep mentioning is fully corrected fluxes. Well, those come in the form of our EasyFlux DL. EasyFlux DL provides fully corrected outputs of fluxes, <clears throat> atmospheric properties, diagnostics, and energy balance, and also intermediate processing results in raw time series. It does this on the CR3000 with a maximum of a 10 hertz measurement, and it can do it on the CR6 and the CR1000X up to 20 hertz. So for the first time, we're able to, to really offer those fully corrected fluxes right on the data logger. At the same time, providing you raw time series if you want to go back and process your own fluxes. We also offer another piece of software called EasyFlux Web. And EasyFlux Web has the following benefits. It allows you to monitor your network of flux instruments, biomet sensors, and even uh, standard uh, research grade weather stations can be put into EasyFlux Web. It gives you custom alerts with email notification, quick reference of metadata and field notes by simply clicking on the individual stations. Uh, you can have administrator choices of read write abilities of all your users. And we give you a flexible offering of either a local copy, which can live on your own server, or a subscription-based cloud plan that's hosted through Campbell Scientific. That was my last slide. Thank you for your attention and for joining me in this webinar today. And at this time, I'll take any questions.